I have to confess I, that I confess to Jim that I'm an alum, so. I, uh, but I didn't take out my uh, big green um, uh, jacket or put it on. So I, I just wanted, I'm only going to take a few minutes and uh, just talk about another example of uh, uh, what this is like in the real world. And I'm just going to build on the example that Uma gave earlier of the Improved Count Out. Uh, network that's uh, got a registry where we're using the data to support um, clinical care, quality improvement, and research all pretty much at the same time. So um, in order to understand some of the regulatory challenges that we're facing, it's important to understand how we use the data. So the data are collected at the point of care in the electronic medical record, and they're transferred into the registry. And the registry oper operates, as Ken Mandel says, as a sidecar, runs uh, because we're supporting 66 different institutions that have a variety of different medical records. Um, we put the data into a registry that are, is used to uh, support uh, clinical functionality that's not available at many of the care centers, like uh, tools that the clinicians use for pre-visit planning or population management. Um, those are provided in real time, on a, uh, updated on a daily basis. Um, they also, uh, physicians also use the data to get comparative um, quality and uh, performance reports so they can compare their uh, performance with one another. And they also use the data for research. Um, the registry includes personal health uh, information because um, like uh, the patient's name, their date of birth, their, um, and other identifiers, um, and that's because we use the data so to support uh, clinical care. Um, but those pieces of information are stripped off before the data are put into uh, the registry itself. And then when the data are pushed back out to the care centers, the personal for clinical care, the personal identifiers are, are reattached. Um, there's also a consent management tool that's part of the technology, so we know which patients have consented for research and which patients haven't. Um, and so when we began this work uh, five years ago, there were nine centers. Um, we had a single protocol that was distributed to the various centers, um, but uh, it got modified a little bit, and each consent form got modified a little bit. And uh, um, as we uh, started, uh, and some, and there were differences of opinion among the IRBs about what the project uh, really involved. Some of them determined that it was a quality improvement project, and so no consent was required. And as the network grew, we decided that it was uh, important to have a more standardized approach. So we went to a federated model in which the centers could choose to rely on Cincinnati Children's as a central IRB. Um, and uh, there was a standard protocol and a single consent form. And there's, there are also data use agreements and business associates agreements because of the data transfer that's taking place. Um, the consent form informs the patients that they are part of, that their data are being used for clinical care and QI, and it asks them to consent for the use of the data for research. Um, so uh, we have uh, quite a, a sense of urgency about making this process run smoothly because we know that patients who participate in the system do better. Um, it, it currently, um, of the, so how is it going? Of the 65 centers, 43% um, have chosen to rely on Cincinnati Children's uh, IRB. And what we've, what we've observed is that there's quite a bit of variation among the IRBs in uh, regarding this, the complexities of this type of data sharing, um, where some of it's used for clinical care, some of it's used for research. Um, and there's also differences of opinion about the kinds of risks that are involved uh, for patients. There's also a lot of confusion among the physicians uh, and the care teams about uh, HIPAA regulations and uh, uh, IRB oversight. Um, there's, uh, for example, very limited appreciation among physicians and the care teams about just how much uh, data sharing uh, takes place under HIPAA uh, authorization presently. Um, and this whole process is time consuming. It takes our, our core team about 22 hours um, and 82 emails on average per um, care center to work through um, the uh, IRB approval and uh, legal agreements that takes place. Uh, the maximum actually uh, was uh, took uh, five lawyers, three of theirs and two of ours, uh, four conference calls, 130 emails in six months to get the IRB and uh, 
data use agreements approved. Um, meanwhile, the patients were not exposed to uh, the benefits of the system. Um, in addition, several of the care centers, two out of the 66, have decided that they're not willing to share, share uh, personal health information outside their um, institutions, and so they're setting up an, a separate encryption program to identify and re-identify the patients. This has taken them a long time. One of the care centers is uh, not making, we have the data to show that they're not making the kinds of improvements in outcomes that all the rest of the um, uh, net, network sites are. So we think there's a lot of opportunities. There are a huge number of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. First, um, we need to do a lot more about how to inform patients and make them aware of uh, just uh, how a network like this can be of benefit to them. It's most people are, most of the patients are interact, used to interacting around their own clinician and don't really think about the benefits of being part of a big network. Um, and this information needs to be done without cluttering up the already too precious time that patients have with their doctors. Um, we also um, uh, need to be communicating more about uh, just the safeguards that are in place. It turns out that we have had one breach of security. It happened when a, a, a stack of paper records were um, lifted out of a clinic. Um, all the sites that are using the electronic system uh, have, there has been no breach of the security. It's, uh, and it's uh, totally audited. Um, and then the last opportunity is to, um, uh, to uh, educate clinicians and uh, IRBs and uh, 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 health systems about the uh, uh, potential of doing it differently. Our current approach is focused on building some momentum by trying, by, uh, we've uh, gotten uh, IRB chairs from three of the big children's hospitals to get together to uh, create a master reliance agreement that's uh, weeks away from being signed that we think um, other institutions will start to sign on to as a way of making it easier uh, for uh, IRB uh, approval to take place. So hopefully that's a useful example for us to consider.